Different genre. That was great. Thanks, Zach and band. That was awesome. So my name is Hans. I'm one of the pastors here. It feels like a new beginning today because it is. This is very cool. We do have coffee. Yes. Things are kind of getting back to normal, right? Whatever that was. So it's exciting. Uh, let's see. If you are new here today, I want to give you a special welcome. And I would love to meet you. Randy would love to meet you out at the Connect Spot in the lobby afterwards. You could also text Clearwater to 77411. That's another way to connect. But we just want to meet you and greet you. So a couple things coming up. Next, this, this coming Saturday from 8 to 10, we've got a men's breakfast. Boy, this is going to be men's day, I think. I like men's stuff. So. so we have a great men's breakfast coming up. Join us. There's no cost to it. Just come for great fellowship and a time to connect with other men and a great talk, I'm sure. So, And I want to talk to you about a serving opportunity. This is actually for women, too but it's kind of leans heavily towards men. We are recruiting for our safety and security team. And if you are interested in being a part of that, you can connect with my friend back there, Mike, wave Mike. If you can't find him, you're blind because he's all uniformed up. Um, so <laughs> he's right there. And Waldo, you can connect with Waldo too, right there. Wave Waldo. Where's Waldo? He's right there. Okay. So those are great. Those are two things. So today is Father's Day, and we're really excited about this. You know, on Mother's Day, we kind of did, uh, did a cool thing for the moms, and we gave them chocolate. And I was thinking, what do men really want? And there was bacon. That's exactly what I was thinking, actually. And I was trying to figure out, how do I give all the guys bacon? And I, I just couldn't figure it out. So, I know that they want meat, right? Guys want meat. So, I, 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 I think that's what Randy said. Um, so, we are going to give all the men Slim Jims afterwards, because they want meat. So, as you're leaving, men, grab some Slim Jims on the way out so you can have your meat. Good call, Hans. Slim Jims. Hey, why don't, why don't we just do this? Why don't we have, if you're a dad or a granddad, why don't you just stand up? We want to honor you. Thanks, guys, for all you do. In a culture that uh, devalues fatherhood, at this church, we want to honor dads. They are so important in the lives of a family. Man, just uh, appreciate all you guys do. So, such good stuff. Welcome to Clearwater. Welcome to our first 10 o'clock service. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you like the 10 o'clock time, or if you don't, give me a thumbs down. Oh, good. I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. Okay, we've got a couple thumbs down. Thank you. Ushers, please have these people. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's okay to say what you feel. Um, yeah, we'll be doing this for the summer, and we'll see what happens this fall. But uh, anyway, for right now, we're going to go 10 o'clock. Clearwater is a church that is all about Jesus, magnifies the Bible as the Word of God. We're a church that's all about reaching people who don't know Jesus and then making people into sold out, wholehearted disciples of Jesus. We want to encourage everyone that attends regularly to be a part of a small group. We're going to be developing more and more small groups. Hans just started a small group for men. We're going to start another uh, small group for men in the fall, which should be awesome. We're going to we're going to continue to encourage women's small groups and small groups that are a mixture of everybody, okay? Just hope you'll consider praying about being a part of that. Welcome to our series on Galatians. Religion ruins everything. 
That's what we've been talking about for several weeks now. Today our message is called Truth Exposed. How many of you have ever had someone expose something to you that you were hiding and it was exposed and you were embarrassed or you were shamed? Man, it's rough. Frankly, that's what we're talking about today. That is the big reason God gave the Old Testament law to us, is to expose truth in us. So we're going to get to chapter 3, verse, beginning in verse 15 today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it there, Galatians 3, 15. Here's Paul's argument. Are you ready? What he's going to say is this, salvation has always been by faith, not by law, and has always been centered on Jesus. It's just so cool when you read the Old Testament and you understand it through the lens of Paul, Paul sees that from the very beginning, it was all about Jesus. Now, today I'm going to be teaching from what we call the Passion New Testament because some of what was written in the English translation or in the New English translation or English Standard Version, excuse me, um, is a little difficult to understand. So I, I went to the Passion Translation, which is a newer translation and is much easier to understand because it's in the common vernacular. So verse 15 says, beloved friends, let me use an illustration that we can all understand. Technically, when a contract is signed, it can't be changed after it's been put into effect. It's too late to alter the agreement. Now what he's going to do is he's going to go back to the days of Abraham and he's going to say that the Old Testament, testament is another word for covenant, so when God made the old covenant, he made it with Abraham, and it was a covenant based on faith, not based on laws. Now God put the laws in later, and we'll see why, but that didn't change the original intent of salvation by faith. Pretty cool. Verse 16, remember the royal proclamation God spoke over Abraham and to Abraham's child. God said that his promises were made to pass on to Abraham's child, not children. And who is this child? The son of promise, Christ himself. Man, that, that is good, what we call exegesis. Now, if you go home and say the pastor today was talking about an extra Jesus, I'm not. I'm talking about exegesis. Exegesis is looking into the scripture and pulling out of it what it means, and that's what Paul's doing. Because in the original Hebrew, he says, to your seed, I will bless all the nations. And he didn't say to your seeds, it's to your seed, referring to Jesus. Beautiful picture of Jesus. To your child, your descendant, Jesus. I'm going to bless all the nations of the world. Through Jesus, all nations are blessed. This means that the covenant between God and Abraham was fulfilled in Messiah and cannot be altered. Yet the written law was not even given to Moses until 430 years after God had signed his contract or covenant with Abraham. Guys, anybody know off the top of your head how long the United States has been a nation? <clears throat> I see the calculators. 150. Pretty close to 250 years. That's, I mean, come on guys, that's a long time. Think about 430 years. We go back 430 years, we're back into the 1700s, people. Maybe the late 1600s. Wow, that's a long time. 
So think about the fact that Abraham was given this promise through Messiah who will come through your lineage. Will I bless all the nations? But it was still 430 years after that that the law came. And people look today at the law as the Old Testament. But really the Old Testament is what God said to Abraham, pointing to Jesus. The law then doesn't supersede the promise since the royal promise was given before the law. If that was the case, it would have nullified what God said to Abraham. We receive all the promises because of the promised one, not because we kept the law. So he is brilliant. You see, what the problem is is that he's having all these people called Judaizers coming into his churches that he's planted in Galatia. And they're telling all the Gentiles that they have to follow the Old Testament, Old Covenant law in order to become followers of Jesus. And he's using this brilliant argument to say, look, that's not part of the Old Covenant. It's always been about faith. It's not about the law. So then he says, why then was the law given at all? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. But the law was des designed to last only until the coming seed, the child who was promised. Okay. Catch this. The Old Testament law was given to show you and me the condition of our sinful heart. Without getting an understanding of our sinfulness before God, we don't realize we need a Savior. Are you catching that? You see, if, if we get rid of the law, the, the law does this. It says, woe is me. I'm miserable. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do any of it. It's really funny because Paul writes in Philippians 3, he says, guys, I was the perfect Jew. I kept the law. And he says, the righteousness, the right standing with God that comes through the law, I was blameless. Now, you have to look a little more. What that, what that says literally is, I kept the law externally perfect. Man, that makes me tired right there. But then you look at Romans 7, and there was this one law called you shall not covet. And coveting is something that goes on in here. Not that anybody can see. If I'm coveting, nobody can see it. And Paul said when that law came, oh gee. So I'd been keeping it externally perfect, but then when it said don't covet, he was convicted by the law and he realized, I've not kept it perfect. Not only that, but he kept the law so perfect that his whole focus was on the law and not on the child, the Messiah that was to come. His whole focus was on the law. Now, if you're from the Mountain Life days, you've heard this story many times. I, I just love telling it, though, so I'm sorry if I'm boring you. But when I was a young boy, we lived about a quarter mile from a really nice golf course, a private golf course. And there was a drainage ditch that went right through the middle of it, and guys would knock their golf balls into that thing. And my dad was an avid golfer. And he just wanted to give me something to do. So he would tell me and my dog, Joe, to go get golf balls out of the ditch. And he would give me a quarter per ball. Now that's motivation. And I was glad to see that at a private snooty golf club, guys still locked, knocked a lot of golf balls into the ditch. I mean, they were coming down by the dozens. So I had this dog, half Springer Spaniel, half Cocker Spaniel.
spaniel, and he was just a great little mutt, and his name was Joe. And Joe loved the water. And so he and I, I'd ride my bike, holding onto the leash, we'd ride the bike up to the ditch, and we would jump into the water, I'd be waiting, and he'd be swimming, and we'd be looking for golf balls. And Joe could see a golf ball, this is no kidding, stick his head underwater, and I don't know what was going on under there, but I'd see bubbles come up, and then he would grab a golf ball and bring it to me. Now, is that not cool? That's a cool dog. And so Joe and I are just getting golf balls, and man, I'm thinking the money, cha-ching, bada-bing. And then Joe and I would have fun because he was a great, great fetcher. So I'd throw a golf ball in the water. He'd jump through the water and jump, go underwater and get me the golf ball. There were tons of rocks under there. How he could discern where the ball was just blew me away. Well, of course, then you kind of do the fun thing where you pretend to throw it downstream, but I threw it upstream. So I'd throw it downstream, away Joe would go, and then I'd throw it upstream. And Joe would stick his head underwater, blow bubbles, look for the golf ball, could not find it anywhere. And so then I began to say, Joe, Joe, look at me. It's up there. And Joe, literally, he would look at my hand and he would go like this. And he could not comprehend that this finger was pointing at where he needed to go. All he could see was my hand. Now, I understand that there are some really well-trained dogs, which Joe wasn't, that can follow a hand signal and go that direction, but all he could see was my hand. That is a picture of the law. The law points to Jesus. And what our tendency to do is to just look at the law. What the law does is it shows us that we have a sinful heart. Have you guys ever tried to keep all the laws? Probably most of us have. It's, it's a fruitless endeavor. And so the law says you couldn't keep it, and then it condemns you. Have you ever felt condemned by the law? Felt condemned by the church maybe because you felt because you were under law? Yeah. The law was given to show us that we cannot please God. When we finally tire of trying to earn our way to him, that's when we're ready to receive grace. Now Paul goes on in verse 19, when God gave the law, he gave it first to angels. They gave it to Moses, his mediator, who then gave it to the people. Now a mediator does not represent just one party alone, but God fulfilled it all by himself. Since that's true, should we consider the written law to be contrary to the promise of new life? How absurd. Truly, if there was a law that we could keep which would give us new life, then our salvation would come by law keeping. Paul says, man, if, if, if law could give us life, then we should keep the law. But it can't happen. Nobody finds life through that. Do you know who the people were that hated Jesus the most? The people that kept the law the best, the Pharisees. They were focused on the law. Paul goes on in verse 22, but the scriptures make it clear that the whole world is imprisoned by sin. Man, if there's not a true statement, wow. That is so true. This was so the promise would be given through faith to people who simply believe in Jesus Christ. The law was given to show us our sin, expose the truth that we have sinned, and then to convict us that we need God. Frankly, it does better at condemning than convicting. Let me just say this. 
I don't know about you, but I have met so many people, many of them in my own family, who are in a deconstruction of their faith. I'd kind of like to just get a show of hands. Do you know somebody who is going through what they are calling a deconstruction of their faith, or they're going through a time where they are just pushing away from the church because they've had enough of God? Do you know anybody like that? It's a lot of us. I would like to suggest this. I think that what people are rejecting is the law and a life under law rather than rejecting the glorious Jesus or they're rejecting a misrepresented representation of Jesus. They're just, they're not understanding how good he is because I just don't think you'd want to push away from him if you knew how good he really is. Much of the deconstruction, much of the rejection of the church today is happening because people see the church, see the Bible as a book of rules rather than of life. Now, let me clarify something. There's three types or kinds of Old Testament laws. Let me go over those with you. First, there are civil laws. Those are laws that guided the building of a godly, and just nation. You see, when the law was given, God was creating a brand new nation, the nation of Israel, and he was trying to create civil laws that would tell them how to have a just nation. One of the civil laws they had was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, many of us hear that today and we think, oh, that sounds horrible. No, you know what that was? That was so different for that culture at that time. What it meant was the punishment must be equal to the crime. So just. The punishment is equal to the crime. And then they gave laws about like if your ox gets out of your, out of your pasture and goes to your neighbor's pasture and he gores your neighbor's ox, here's what you have to do. And it was all based on justice. It was really just. It was probably the first just law given to a culture since the Code of Hammurabi some hundred years or several hundred years before this. After that were the ceremonial laws. These are laws about how to worship God and keep him central. The ceremonial law said, okay, here's what you do when you sin. You go to the temp or tabernacle and you, you sacrifice an animal. Uh, you do all this stuff that you have to do. It went through telling about all the things that a high priest had to wear. If you've ever read Leviticus, you've waded through that. And it's all the ceremonial law. It also mentions seven holidays that you're to have and enter into and have, you know, really kind of a command to celebrate God seven times a year, kind of a neat command. And then there were moral laws. The moral laws were the Ten Commandments and like the laws like those. Now, catch this. Are you ready for this? For followers of Jesus, this is what's happened. When you become a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes within you and the law of God is written on your heart. And it's what you yearn to do. Are, are, you, are you hearing this? This is different than what the church teaches. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, I joyfully agree with the law of God in my inner man, my heart. I love the law. It's just I can't do it. I love the law. It's written on my heart. Now, let me clarify this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are not under the law to have a right relationship with Jesus. Okay? Like, you don't, you don't have to obey the law to be in right relationship with Jesus. You know what it's all based on? It's all based on a relationship with Jesus based on faith. It's, it's completely what it is. The law, like you being able to keep the law perfectly. 
Okay, let's just get a show of hands. Uh, raise your hand if you've never lied. Whew. Okay, raise your hand if you've never lusted. Raise your hand if you've never desired something that your friend or neighbor has and you wanted it for yourself. You guys, we're over right here. You know what? You are perfect candidates for grace. Because we've all messed up. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When I looked up that word all in the Greek, it, it means all. All. We've all messed up. Now, why do we have the law still? This is cool. For followers of Jesus, the law continues to remind us what morality is. The Holy Spirit uses the law as vocabulary to speak to our hearts. But we're not, we don't have to keep it in order to be right with Jesus. We have a right relationship with Jesus simply because we believe in him. And because his righteousness is our righteousness. Now, there's an evil plan. Guys, do you understand that there is an evil plan in the world today? It has evolved in our culture like you can't believe. Can we go to the next slide? There we go. There is an evil plan in our culture. And that plan is to move to a secular culture. You, do, you, do you understand, folks, that the American country is a weird country because it is based on Judeo-Christian law? It's weird. And so we want to move to a secular culture. But here, here's the deal. Catch this. Morality is based on something. So where do you get your morality? If we throw away the moral law of the Old Testament, then we're going to make a new moral law based on something else. So our culture is at this point right now where we're pushing away from the moral law of God. We don't want all this. It's interesting. In Psalm chapter 2, Psalm 2, I love what it says. It says, the, na the nations or the kings of the earth rage against the Lord and against his Messiah. This is every country where people are not faithfully following Jesus. Not following the law, but following Jesus. What they do is they create their own set of morality. And it's based on something that sh it, it, it changes by the year. Our culture has said the moral law of God is condemning. And they're right. Because <laughs> a lot of them grew up in a church where what they heard was Old Testament law. Where they heard legalism. Because the church today tends to interweave law and grace and we don't even know we're doing it. And so people have rejected the law of God and they've said, we're going to make this country based on our law and that law is going to be based on what everybody here kind of thinks generally. Mark Gunger, a pastor, speaker, and counselor, he's a hilarious guy, G-U-N-G-O-R, Mark Gunger, 
I follow him on Facebook. And he recently posted something that says, this is what every conversation on morality in the modern world looks like. Did you catch that? This is what every conversation about morality in the modern world looks like. Secular society says this, we want to do X. And the church then says, you are free to do it. Secular society says, but you think X is wrong. The church says, yeah, yeah, we do. Secular society says, that's because you want to control us. The church says, no, uh, you're free to do what you want. Secular society says, but you think X is wrong. The church says, yeah, but only because we want your ultimate good, which is the definition of love. We want your ultimate good. And that's how God spells love. We want what's best for you. Secular society says, but, but, but we want to do X. The church says, well, you're free to do it. Secular society says, but we want you to say that X is good. The church says, well, we can't say that. So you know what secular society says? Why do you hate us? Why do you hate us? And the church has been seen as a hate organization. Because the culture has kicked the moral law away and now defines this as morality. And because we hold to old covenant moral law as the basis for a civil society, for a healthy society, what they, it's amazing how they have determined that the church is an organization, organization of hate. And they've turned white into black, light into dark. something Paul told us in Romans chapter 1 we would do when we turned our back on the God of the universe. Maybe you've been absorbed into secular culture and somebody brought you to church today. I just want to say this to you. I, I just want to say this. We're a mixture of all sorts of imperfect people. And I am the leader, the lead imperfect person. I'm, I'm just so imperfect. I mess up every day. And you may catch from us an air of condemnation. But what, me, what you may perceive as condemnation is really just us holding to a standard that God gave us. But we don't mean to condemn you. The law is condemning you in your own heart. And what I want you to use that condemnation for is to run to Jesus. Because there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So in the new covenant, there is no condemnation. None. I was cracking up last week. I went to Grand Junction, met this pastor, and he was telling me his story. He was telling Hans and Peggy and Gay and I his story, and he was telling it unabashedly. Yeah, I was 19, my girlfriend was 17, and I got her pregnant. And, you know, I was trying to follow Jesus at the time. I just had no clue how to do it. And I got her pregnant, and they kicked me out of church. But isn't it funny that he can just talk so openly about it? I mean, this is a pastor. Yeah, got my girlfriend pregnant. Why, why can he do it so openly? Because there's no condemnation. None of us were going, what? Oh, oh, you bad. Oh, you. Who even let you pastor? He just openly said it. And then there were other people there who just said, man, I'm just, a, you know, I. I just messed up my first marriage. 
It was my fault. And, and none of us were going, well, what are you even doing here? No. Because we can all relate. There's just no condemnation. So verse 23 says, so until the revelation of faith for salvation was released. Isn't that interesting? God had to release a revelation. This is a, something that God had to reveal. The law was a jailer holding us as prisoners under lock and key until the faith which was destined to be revealed would set us free. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you can probably remember a time when you were trying to be good and you could not. In fact, there are probably followers of Jesus here today that have a certain sin in your life that you cannot get free from. Did you know that that is all due to trying to be right in the eyes of God by trying to obey the law? The law never can help you become holy. All it does is kick you in, while you're on the ground and condemn you. You big idiot. You tried. You couldn't do it. Stupid. Kicks you while you're down. The law is a jailer saying, you're not coming out of there until you go, help, I need a savior. I need, I need something other than this old law stuff. The law was our guardian until Christ came so that we would be saved by faith. Interesting term, this word guardian. It's a term used by wealthy Greek and Roman families for, a, for an adult who would keep their eye out on young people until they became of age. So a guardian is the law. And how, how many of you have raised perfect children? Would you raise your hand? Guys, we're not doing so well today. Did you know that as a child growing up under the law, you know, don't do that, honey, don't do that, don't do that. I mean, they start to realize they need God. I'll never forget my, my daughter who is, if any of you have met my daughter, she'll be here this summer. I can't wait for you to meet her. She was one hard-headed woman for many years just extremely hard-headed, rebellious. I mean, she was a mess. And something happened her fifth grade year. She gave her life to Jesus. Now, I had been saying to her for years, now, sweetheart, listen to me. If, if you will if you will honor mom and dad, it will go well for you. But if you don't honor mom and dad, then it won't go well for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I want things to go well for you. So will you please honor mom and dad? And I remember that fifth grade year, we were in this large church building and I, I was the worship leader and, um, and I was busy talking to people, and, and I said, Hannah, will you and Dan, your big brother, go down to the children's area, which was long ways down this long hallway. Will you go down there and wait for us? She said, yeah. So they went down there, and I was used to hard-headed Hannah. So I thought, what has she gotten into while I've been up here talking to people? So I walk down the hallway, just going, oh man, what am I going to find when I get down here? And there she was with her brother, standing, waiting for me. And I said to her, hey, Hannah, do you know how 
happy it makes me as your dad that you did as I asked you to do. You just made my whole day. You made my whole week. I am so proud of you, baby girl. You just made me really proud. And she didn't tell me till years later, but she said something clicked in her head that day. You know what? If I just do what they say, things will go well for me. And she began to, the Holy Spirit wrote that on her heart. And, and she just began to do as we said. And it was only because we said what we said that, that she said, I want to honor my parents because God said it's a good thing. I remember as a sophomore, see what happened was she had braces through junior high. She had horrible acne and... Um, and she even had lots of warts on her hands and stuff. And she just felt like an ugly duckling. And then something happened her sophomore year. She got rid of all her warts. Her braces came off. And she had this big, beautiful smile. I mean, the smile to award-winning smile. And all of her acne went away. And all the boys said, who is that? And the temptation was great. And... One time she told me she was going over to her friend's house and she really went to a drinking party. And she got home that night and I said, honey, did you have a good time with your friend? Oh yeah, sure did. Oh daddy, and she fell apart. Just, I didn't even have to get on, she just fell apart. Daddy, I, I, I went to a party. I didn't drink, but I went to the party and I lied to you and I'm just so sorry. You see, something had been written on her heart. And she hated to grieve me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I love my daddy. The Holy Spirit cries out, Daddy, Father. And she, she had it, man. She still has it. It's wild. So she got out from underneath that guardian and she got into Jesus. Paul says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian of the law. Friend, did you catch that? We are not under the Old Testament law. Get, what are you doing under there? Get out from under there. You have all become true children of God by faith in Jesus. Look at this, faith immersed you into Christ and now you are covered and clothed with his life. Are you catching that? Immersed. Man, that's like, guys, that's like that Kit Kat commercial where you see the chocolate immersing the, the nice inside of the Kit Kat. It's been immersed in chocolate. And it's so good. You've been immersed into Jesus. And your former life is no longer around. You are a new creation in Christ. You've been immersed into Christ. And God looks at his record, not your record. And we no longer see each other in our former state. Whoa. Jew or non-Jew, rich or poor, male or female, because we're all one through our union with Jesus Christ. That is a massive statement right there. Paul literally said Jews and Gentile are equal in the eyes of God. Every Jew reading that just went, poof, their brains blew out. And if you belong to Christ, then you are now Abraham's child. Did you catch that? One child, Jesus. But now, if you've been immersed into Jesus, or Jesus has been immersed over you, or whatever you want to call it, you are now his child and a true heir of all his blessings because of the promise God made to Abraham. 
So you're blessed when you walk outside, you're blessed when you walk inside, you're just stinking blessed everywhere you go. You say, well, I don't feel it. Don't be led by your feelings. Be led by truth. May I ask you to just close your eyes for a moment? I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right now. But is there anybody here that would raise their hand and say, Randy, I have been trying my hardest to overcome a sin in my life, and I cannot overcome it. And would you just pray for me right now? Is there anybody like that? Nobody else is going to say it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All over the place. Here's how you get out from under the law. You don't say to God, God, I'm sorry I did that. I will never do it again. No, that's putting, that's putting it on you to overcome it. What I want to invite you to do is every time you sin, take this. Say, God, thank you that you don't condemn me. You may have convicted me, which is surgery where God wants to take out cancer. But you didn't kick me while I was down. And second, God, I just want to confess to you that I am absolutely incapable of stopping this sin. Acknowledge that you are absolutely incapable of overcoming that sin. Just acknowledge it. Lord, I can't do it. And so I reach out to you, Jesus, my Savior, that you will free me from it. That's all I want you to do. And you come back and you talk to me. Talk to Hans. Talk to one of the elders. And just tell us the victory you experienced because you have just stepped from law into grace. Now, is there anybody here that would say, Randy, someone brought me to church today because it's Father's Day or whatever, and I have rejected the church for a long time, and, um, and would you just pray for me that I'll understand what the real Jesus is all about? Does anybody like that? Okay, thank you. Dear God, I just want to say thank you that you are present. Thank you that in your presence there is fullness of joy. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't condemn us. Thank you, Jesus, that you don't kick us while we're down, but you come to us with open arms. And Father, we just thank you for the grace that you give to us today. Thank you that we walk in grace, not in law. So Jesus, we're going we're gonna to take a little time to remember what you did for us on the cross right now. We want to say thank you. Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross on my behalf. And as I partake of the bread and the juice, I just want to say thank you that I'm no longer under law, no longer under jail, but I've been released and set free to be your worshiper, to be your child. And so thank you that your body was broken on my behalf. Thank you that your blood was shed for me and that all my past is gone because I've been immersed in Jesus. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're a guest here, uh, we're going to partake of communion right now. This is where you're, you're welcome. As the band plays a little music, you're welcome to go to one of these side tables and take of the bread and the juice at your leisure. If you don't feel like you want to do it, you don't have to. By the way, there is gluten-free right up here at the front. All right? So this is the only gluten-free one right here. Okay? All the rest on the sides are there. I, I just invite you to take it and maybe pray with your family or friends.